All right, here we go again. Um, my voice is still working, so we, we shall continue. Um, so first, a warning. I think I changed some of these in the middle of the night last night, so I might have some that are out of order. But uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, so, and, and for the Red Hat folks, you've heard some of this already, so it, it would be a little bit redundant. So, uh, about 18 months ago, um, I, was, I was working on a patch for a, a very, very old regression uh, in our uh, set jump, long jump warnings, and concluded that the only way to fix this was to build uh, some smarts into RTL where you could find a call site and then find a test after the call site and where it goes. And I said, well, it's RTL. What could go wrong? <laughs> Conceptually, I knew that there would be a million different things targets would do that were going to make writing that scanner incredibly painful. And so I said, you know, I don't want to have to build every target every time. Um, I, I would like to use a tool. Um, now, we, we could do this with a, with a simple shell script. And we, we've all done it. it it's not hard. Um, but you know, if, if you do it right, you can, you can do something much more interesting. So I looked at uh, different uh, build, and, build and test automation systems. Um, and, and really, my, my goal was to find something that I could use off the shelf, add what, you know, whatever scripting I needed around it, but that it would ultimately be extendable. Because while I, you know, I do want to make life easier to be able to test this patch, um, I really want to make my life easier across the board. Um, and what I settled on was, was a system called Jenkins. So who here is actually doing any, has done anything with Jenkins? A fair number. Um, so as, as those who use it, you know, it's, it's a build, test, deploy automation system. Um, it is amazingly complex. The things you can do with it are mind-boggling. Um, you know, if, if I was to try to guess what percentage of Jenkins we're using, it's probably like two. <laughs> um, you know, it is very, very Java-centric, but you don't actually have to do anything in Java if you don't want to. Um, it does have, it has a plug-in ar architecture. It has reasonably wide acceptance. Um, it has a web UI. It has a, a command line interface. Um, it has the ability to control multiple systems of multiple architectures. That can be useful. Um, you, can, you can write your description for how to build something. You can write it in shell script. You can write it in Python. It has its own domain-specific languages for writing these pipelines. Um, it has a concept of build artifacts. So when you when you've built something, you can save pieces of data, whether it be test results, or uh, was it the the GCC eight cycle where we had the lib standard C plus plus ABI goof, where Jakob's like, "Can you get this data?" I'm like, yeah, sure. We we can we can we can get anything we want out of this uh, in terms of if, if it's built during the system, I can save it off and and pull it later. So. Once I'd chosen the system, you know, what, what, was the, what, do we, what are we doing for our te up, up, upstream testing, and can I take that and, and do something as good at or better in an automated way? So all of you know that, that the primary system we have is, is a bootstrap and a regression test. We all know how to do that. We all do it all the time. Um, and as a community, we do really, really good at testing you know, x86-64, AR-64, PowerPC Little Indian. We do a, a pretty good job at S390. There's just not a whole lot of S390 systems out there, but it is being tested on a regular basis. 686 is getting harder, um, just because most people don't actually boot their things in 32-bit mode. Um, Jakob does test in 32-bit mode, and it does regularly find problems. Yeah, it's... it's <laughs> yeah. Um, and once you leave you know, kind of that space that, that's, that's uh, enumerated up there, very, very little gets tested. Um, probably the, the exception would be uh, John Anglin tests HPPA. I think he can get one bootstrap in a week, um, on, a, on a good week, assuming it all worked. Um, and then the test week run, and, and this, you know, it's roughly 300,000 tests when you add C, C++, Fortran, LibGomp, and so on and so forth. Uh, it does not include ADA, it does not include Go. So our, our standard bootstrap and tests is about 300,000 tests. Um, one of the other systems we have is, is config list item K. Um, this, this started many years ago um, and was primarily useful when we had a lot of conditional compilation. So what this test does is we have a, uh, every target GCC knew about, 
or at least most of them, um, got put in a make file and said, that make file will build all 219, 230, whatever the number was. Um, but it will only build the compiler. Build CC1, CC1+, plus, uh, the ADA compiler. But there's no verification that the compiler can actually generate code. You can link. That's it. Um, there's no verification the code's correct, so you don't know if the assembler can even accept anything you've built. Um, and because, as a project, we've been eliminating conditional compilation, its value is dropping dramatically. Um, I, I'm not even sure the last time any, I heard of anybody doing a config list.mk build. Has anybody done one in the last year? Not a single hand. That tells me a lot. Kind of the, the, the third space where people do testing, and, and I think uh, Martin Liska does, does a fair amount of this. Um, I do some. Uh, and, and like the GLibsy project, and they're not here anymore, but they, they do a fair amount of this on their own, um, is building a, a, a set of packages that we think are useful and interesting. Um, kernel, GLibsy, then utils, GCC, and then we're usually done. Again, Martin Liska being Firefox. Firefox. You, you, you do more. Um, but the, the point is, is that there's a, there's a set that we've determined, you know, th there's value in doing this stuff. Um, but it's not pervasive, it's not regularly built, again, outside of individual contributors. Um, and are there other packages we should be doing this with? It's a question. Um, so after, after looking at what we're doing, I said, all right, I can actually build a system that does all that for us. <laughs> um, and, and I actually end up building two. Uh, there is a tester for, for upstream GCC, which is focused on testing uh, basic functionality of our code generator across a wide swath of targets. And there's a Fedora tester, which is designed to essentially take a uh, GCC, whether it be a snapshot, whether it be a development branch that somebody's working on, or even a, a, a patch from Florian who's probably in the glibc buff that he wants to say, what's, what's the impact if I don't allow you to do an implicit function call to a, to a function without, a, without a, a, a prototype? What would happen? Nothing good. <laughs> yeah, and I think I got things out of order here. Uh, let me find... That's what you get for changing your, your deck at late at night. All right, native. Probably looks very much like what you guys have done before. Um, whoop, I still got the wrong slide. One back. Build and install bin utils, build and install GCC uh, with, with the standard bootstrap, build and install glibc, build the kernel. Nothing radical here. We've all done it. Run the test suite, compare the previous results. That's easily automated. So why bother with, with doing this in our system? It ensures these secondary architectures are constantly built. I build an i686 every freaking day. It runs a test suite on a true 32-bit build every freaking day. Um, we also do it on PowerPC 32-bit every day. Um, and, and while we could add more package testing to this, I don't think we really need to except for GDB. Um, GDB, there, there is a very tight integration between GCC and GDB because GDB consumes our debug info. If we screw it up, we really like to know. <laughs> and the only way we're going to know is if GDB is running on a regular basis. Um, I can add that in probably about 10 minutes. The biggest problem will be flaky GDB tests. <laughs> so flaky GCC tests, I remove them. <laughs> and, and there's actually not very many. <laughs> the, 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 it, I could. Um, the question would be is, do the tests still have some kind of value? And, and, and where are they flaky? So there, there's one test that happens to time out if you get slow hardware on one target. It probably means the target's doing something stupid. I don't know what the target was. It was you know, some embedded thing that I don't, you know, I might have even written it, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to go find it and fix it. So the second bucket I, I created was QEMU. So for those who are not familiar with it, QEMU has the ability to run foreign binaries. So I can sit on my x86 box, and I can run HPPA code, or 68000 code, or RISC-5 code. Um, it's actually pretty cool. And if you were to build a root file system with native code for, I don't know, AR64 Big Indian, 
You can true it into it and it'll just work. And it looks native after that point. So we can bootstrap on some of these more arcane architectures. And let me get to the right slide. I think it's this one. Um, that's a list of the ones we're doing it on right now. Um, most of these you'll see. Uh, yeah, there's ARM. People still do ARM stuff. There's RISC-5. Um, AR64 Big Indian, we do it. It has found real bugs. Not sure of the value, though. Um, Alpha, believe it or not, has found a number of generic bugs. <laughs> uh, HPPA is horribly flaky because QMU is buggy. Um, 68,000 just works every day. Of course, I'm going to deprecate it when I get home. <laughs> um, SH4, yeah, those, those consistently work. And we not only do, you know, go through the standard bootstrap cycle, build GC or build glibc, we're in the test suites. And you know what? They're stable. Amazingly, these things are stable. Um, I do think there's an SH3 bug. I have not gone to go look for it. It just doesn't seem like it's worth the effort. Um, now, given that you're emulating these targets, how long does it take? Oh, about 12 hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, I can run through the entire, I can run through all of them in, in a day. I can put something in this system. I come back the next morning, I've got all my results. It does find bugs similarly regularly. Um, now, you know, we are interested in finding generic bugs. I do not care about an alpha backend bug. What I care about is can we find bugs that are lurking that are going to affect our other targets. Um, and in the case of the QEMU testing, if there is a code gen bug, debugging it is hellacious. You have to build a cross GDB, which then attaches to QEMU, which has a GDB server embedded in it. Um, and then you're using GDB, the GDB remote protocol. And those of you who've used GDB remote know that you can't say run. <laughs> you have to quit QEMU, start it back up, and reattach. Um, you don't want to do this with any kind of regularity. Um, and when you have a QEMU bug, it is really annoying. HPPA just kind of fails randomly, and you never know why. If I could give you something that I could report, Richard, I would have months ago. It is so flaky, I can, I, I, I literally, I, I know, Richard, you and I have known each other for like 25 years. I would have given you something if I could. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I, found, I, I find that interesting because we're able to boot the kernel and, and run things under emulated mode relatively well. So. I know. It worked great until like February. And then it just started ping-ponging. It fails during stage two. And if you, if you do attach a debugger to it and start stepping through it, it runs. And it fails later somewhere completely differently. It is just oh, that's weird. weird. And again, I, I spent like two hours trying to track this sucker down and gave up. Huh. And, okay. and, and it's persisted through the latest releases. And, and you only see this on HPPA? Only HPPA. And it's always in the same place until you, until you put it under, under a debugger. You, maybe we're messing up the, 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 the tail queues. It's something we did when we were doing OS work on, on these systems. If you don't get the tail queue right, 99.9% .9 of the time it keeps working. Um, I don't know. Now, you say this happened like in February-ish? Somewhere around February, yeah. Um, that I, I switched the instruction decoding to an automated tool, so Ooh. there might be a bug in there. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. No, no problem. <laughs> if you want, I can give you a cheroot. <laughs> <laughs> and you can you can fire it up, <laughs> Jeff. Uh, yes. When you're doing this in QMU, is this system mode or Linux user mode? Uh, Linux user mode. Okay. Linux user mode. Okay. And how are you finding the OpenMP tests on them? Those fail a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Native QEMU. We're past QEMU. So there are some targets that don't have what I would call a functional QEMU. They have something. It just doesn't work very well. Um, so NIOS, Microblaze, there are some others. Um, or in, in some cases, I haven't bothered to build a true yet. MIPS64, for example. I know I can. It's just a question of time. Um, so for those, you know, we do a fairly standard looking cross build. Build, build cross bin utils, build across GCC, then use them to build the glibc in the kernel. Um, 
It's done in shell script. The dude Lipsy guys are doing the same thing in Python. Nothing really special here. Um, then you run the test suite. Now, in theory, if we told if we told it where the uh, dynamic loader was and where glipsy was, you could actually get execution tests out of this using QMU in user mode. Not currently, haven't currently tried to tackle that problem. But it looks just like a standard cross build. And what I found is this is actually more valuable than doing the QEMU testing. <laughs> by, by the time the QEMU tests are complete, 90% of the time, the cross tests have already found the same bug. So I, I, I really question if, if doing the QEMU test is actually worth it. It's, it's kind of neat and cool, but I think we get just as much value out of, out of doing it as a cross. Elf targets. Um, again, looks like a standard Cross build, you build the bin utils, build GCC. Now we don't have glibc, but we can build a new lib. We can build libgcc and new lib. Um, and what that does uh, over and above config list.mk is you're testing the code generator. Is it, you know, do you ice as soon as you start? We've had targets to do that. <laughs> they have been fixed, but, but we, I, I did run into these. Um, can the assembler assembler what you've given it? We have run into cases. I think, Nick, you're, you're nodding your head. Uh, didn't we have an uninitialized variable that's tracked down in the assembler at some point? <laughs> um, not the most interesting bug, because it was a target we don't care about as, you know, with our Red Hat hats on, but um, still good to fix from a community standpoint. Um, list of targets, not particularly interesting, other than uh, we're trying to get broad testing to look for generic problems. So it, these are a lower level of testing than we see in the, 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 the native or QMU or, or the uh, cross uh, new targets. Um, but I, I have a fake simulator, so I can use either a fake simulator which says it always passes, or it can run the old Cygnus simulator for those targets where it's stable enough. Um, and so we're verifying the code is reasonable. On some targets we're verifying it's actually executing correctly. Um, and tests which scan for optimizations or for warnings, they all work. And so if we're, if we're doing development on something that for, you know, is, is sensitive to, this, to the structure of the IL, where the target has the ability to tweak something, whether it be due to branch costing or costing of an inline mem copy, um, we can actually test this stuff. And, and it's found real issues. And hopefully, you know, if we, if we do our job right, we can use this to catch bugs before we install them. Um, it also turns out to be, it's a great canary for dead ports. <laughs> uh, M32C hasn't built libgcc in about two years. I think we should deprecate it. Epiphany is so unstable that you can't do diffs uh, between your GCC runs. It just kind of, a, a trivial change in the code you generate causes reload to abort or to pass, and you never know what you're gonna get. Um, seems to me, it's a dead port. <laughs> um, Yorn's not here, so he can't complain, so I'm deprecating. Um, <laughs> um, but other than those two, this thing is amazingly stable. If I get a bug, if, if this thing tells me that there was a regression relative to the last run, there's almost always right. It's amazing. Um, and, and in my opinion, it replaces everything we used to do with config list.mk, config list but it's all automated. Um, and there are a few targets that don't have new lib configurations. We build libgcc and say, we're done. Vax. <laughs> Does anybody care about the Vax port? <laughs> so what else could it do? Um, those of you who have, who have uh, had discussions with me know that if you send me a patch in git format, I can put it through the system and I can give you results the next day. That's useful. <laughs> um, and and, it'll, and you know, we do this testing across all the components. Um, right now it's using entirely, almost entirely Red Hat internal resources. So we have, a, we have a test farm, it allocates machines, runs the tests, and the machines get taken away from us because it's part of the test farm, we allocate some more, it just, it just runs. Um, but because it's using Red Hat internal resources, I can't open it up right now. It runs inside of our VPN. Not an option. Um, but still, you know, it, it, it is finding real, real problems, and I think we need to make it publicly available. What else can it do? Um, it understands Git hashes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. How much of what you've done is dependent on, like, the specific Red Hat infrastructure details versus things that could just be generically open? The only thing is uh, allocating the machines. Okay. Calling into, into Beaker job submit right. to get me a machine. Um, so this thing understands git hashes, so when you do see a regression, I've got yesterday's hash, I've got today's hash. 
we're looking at you know a dozen revisions to check. It's fast. So it, it makes it very, very easy to bisect a problem. Um, we're not using it yet. There's a warning analysis pr uh, plugin. It will scan your builds and, and categorize all the warnings that you had and track them over time, gives you graphs. Um, it, it tells you which ones are serious because of security concerns. Um, so that there's other stuff we can do with it that we're not really exploiting right now. What should we be doing with it? Um, you know, we could add more packages to build. Uh, again, I think the only one we want to add to it is GDB because of that tight integration between GCC and GDB. Um, what we really need to do is make it public. And so uh, I, I want us as a project to have a tester. I am not wed to Jenkins. This is just what I built it in. But we should have a, a tester that runs on GCC build farm hardware. It runs all the time. It just constantly churns through all these targets. Um, that I can do. Oh, yes, go ahead. So um, you allocate resources. How much resources do you allocate? Good question. <laughs> um, at any given time, it typically, it typically has 12 machines. Okay. And, and we run a, we're on one job at a time on those machines. And we probably could go with less. Um, the slowest part of this, for, particularly for the, the embedded targets, is actually checking out all the source trees you need. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but, but that probably means the GC compile farm needs more resources. So, um, <laughs> As far as the compile farm, I actually think there is enough resources in the compile farm to not dramatically impact it. We have a whole bunch of dedicated machines that we can assign to GCC if it's if if that would be useful to, to GCC. Yeah, I, I, I think we, I think we can find a way to make this happen. Um, and, and for a while, I actually was using compile farm resources. Uh, particularly, there were some really nice beefy AMD machines, but they were horribly yeah. flaky. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the shared machines are shared. Yep. And so you cannot really... Yeah, I, I don't want to peg them and, and, yeah. and melt them down, because everybody uses them. Absolutely. Right. But we also have dedicated machines that are assigned to one project. Good to know. So, I did not know that, we, that they had dedicated machines. Uh, since less than a year, so, yeah. Good. I think we got a question up here. So two from me. One is your dummy simulator. Is that the solution to the I, I can't execute problem? It's a, sol it's a solution to um, more of a flaky, not a flaky test, but a test, for example, that might clash the heap in the stack. And so, because mo most of the old simulators, that you have a very small address space in them. And yeah. so you get these heap stack collisions. And trivial code changes can cause that collision to either manifest itself visibly or not. Okay, so my, the point of my question is that um, if, you're, if you're building on a cross and you don't have the target hardware, there's still nothing to stop you from running all the compiled tests. Yeah, and, and it does that. Mm -hmm. Right, so that was something that we were talking about at a previous um, cauldron and, or, and also online, I guess. So that would be an interesting thing to see published, how to, what, what you need to do to your board file to make that happen. And the second question is, if I remember Jenkins correctly, um, when you want to have a machine that you connect to to use as a resource, mm -hmm. th the Jenkins instance has to understand how to connect to it, but it doesn't mean that that target machine has to be public to anything else. Is that correct? It, you need what, what I use is SSH. So if I can SSH to it, right. I, can, I can use it. But, but for example, if I wanted to allow you to use one of my PowerPC machines, right, for Darwin, I don't want to make that public to the whole world. Right. I, I might not mind sharing it with you, but I don't want to share it with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I so might the be in a similar is, position. Is, is, there a way of, is there a way of dealing with this that makes it reasonably secure for wacky yeah. architectures like I deal with? There is a ton of authentication stuff in Jenkins and a ton of ways to route jobs to certain systems. I have not used any of it. I've made it... Again, because it was my own system, I just said, turn off all authentication, just let it go. I know there are ways to do what you're, what you're asking. I just don't know them specifically what, how to do it. I know it's possible. Okay. So you said it, you don't care if it's Jenkins or something else. Um, I guess my question is, is if it's not Jenkins and say it's BuildBot, 
sure. what do you lose um, that you're already relying on? With I don't think I lose anything. Okay. Um, this is the, 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 the stuff that actually builds stuff, it's driven by shell script. But you can write in Python. Whatever BuildBot wants, it, it's a page of code. It's, it's nothing. Okay. Really, all I, want, all I would need from BuildBot is the ability to connect to a, a, a resource, send a job. That's what I need. Yeah. Jakob? Or, or sorry. Um, what would be nice, and I haven't seen that you are already testing, is we have offloading as well. So given some availability of hardware, it would be nice to test at least PTX offloading and eventually GCN offloading. Yep. But of course, you need the hardware for that. Yeah, you need, you need the hardware for it. Um, but you know, if, if you have a card in a box, we can say you, know, you need this. Essentially, you can attach a label to the job and say the jobs with this label have to go over here. Uh, and the small comment about uh, QEMU build. Uh, uh, as far as I understand, you still use QEMU user for running. So you, you just set up bin format and then execute binaries. I, I am sorry. I, I have a hard time understanding you. Uh, you told about your QEMU testing. Yes. So you use QEMU user mode, you mm -hmm. just set up bin format and kernel, and execute binaries. Um, it is binaries, I only have to build a kernel, I just need a root file system. So I need a shell, I need uh, a, a compiler in the root, or sorry, in the, the root file system, I need, you know, make, uh, Deja GNU so I can run the tests, um, but I don't actually have to build, I don't have to boot a kernel, I'm strictly user mode. Uh, so, uh, we work. We worked in this mode for several years, but lately we found better solution. Uh, user mode is not so good for all binaries uh, because QEMU user processes binaries slightly in different way, and some tests fail just to QEMU structure. And now you can use QEMU system mode with uh, Plan Nine protocol to uh, to mount rootfs and uh, redirecting serial console to standard output to automate it. So this will work much better, but uh, slightly slower. Yep. I, I had no idea I could do that. <laughs> That's actually kind of slick. Go, Michael. Two, yeah, two, two minor things. One is, is QMU, you of course have the problem that you might have to update QMU. We found a problem with PowerPC where we had actually changed the definition of the architecture, but they forgot to actually publish it, and it matched the current hardware, uh, but QMU was depending on the published definition rather than the, you know, we fix it, but, you know, you do have to occasionally update QMU and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing is, is on Linux, um, you can configure it so that it can run the, the emulator directly. That's and, actually what I'm using. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and and for, for power, um, we use we use native hardware. There's, it's silly to use QMU for, for this kind of stuff. I can access a PowerPC 64 limiting out of the build farm, and then old style PowerPC 64. I think I'm using an, a Red Hat internal box. Right. Well, I, but it doesn't work if you don't yet have the hardware. Yes, <laughs> you 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 have a slightly different problem. <laughs> oh, and my my screensaver kicked in. Other questions while I'm, while I'm getting fired back up. Not a not a question, but a comment, Jeff, down here at the front. Me. Yeah, go. So as you know, I used to work for Renesis, who owned M32C, and in the background I've been texting back with an old pal there. They don't care about M32C either, they're all ARM these days, so you should be good. <laughs> we just kill it. Yep. Deprecate it. Uh, Romana. Oh. Hi. Uh, I've got a question about uh, uh, all the stuff you built. Like you built, a, you built a kernel for all those architectures. Uh, how many uh, patches to the kernel itself do you need to actually build? Uh, because Excellent I've got question. Like 50 or something. To, it, won't be, uh, it won't build most architectures without a whole bunch of patches. Like, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the PowerPC kernel to start with, uh, it uses uh, minus W error. Mm -hmm. I, I, keep, I keep telling them to drop that, but they don't, so <laughs> I do. Uh, because that doesn't work with the uh, most recent GCC, because it has new warnings that they don't. Yep, e excellent question. So uh, one of the things the system has is the ability to patch any one of the tools. So specifically for the kernel, I believe I'm carrying maybe four patches, one of which is that PowerPC issue. One is a 68,000 issue where we have some, something from that would normally be provided by libgcc, I think it's pop count, 
Um, suddenly, we, we, yeah. we have a pop count call. So yeah, it, it, it's trivial stuff. I, I actually include uh, libgcc for most eye detectors. Yeah, I, I haven't. I, I found that the, the kernel maybe every few weeks I need to tweak, you know, something yeah. for you know a week or so, and then I remove the patch when they fix it upstream. But yeah, I, I, I have had to, and I've, I've had to do a little bit for bin utils, had to do a little bit for GCC. It, it, that I consider, it, it's the cost you pay of, of working with a trunk. Right, <laughs> but, but you are using uh, trunk everything. Yep, trunk everything. Great. If, if, if I wasn't using trunk, it really wouldn't be integration testing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so the, 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 the other thing about this that I really think we need, and, and while I could do this, I really gonna be looking for help. Uh, just because I don't have the time, is to build a patch test around this. I've got maybe somewhere between 60 and 80% of this plumbed, where you, in theory, you push a button, you commit your patch into Git, um, and this thing picks it up and runs it for you. And it gives you a result the, at the next day. Um, that, I think, would be unbelievably valuable to, as developers. Having used it for the last year, I use it for almost everything I do. And, you know, it finds bugs in my code. <laughs> I'm happy it does, because I, I, I find myself more and more scared I'm going to check in something, it's going to be broken, and I'm going to have like mid-year performance reviews coming up, and I'm not going to be able to look at it for two weeks. Um, that, that's not a good place to be. Uh, <laughs> so, so I really do want uh, some help fleshing out the patch tester for, for, the, for the upstream community, because I, I think it will, it will be very useful for all of us. So that, that's the upstream tester. We've also got also built in Jenkins, a Fedora tester. Um, more than just adding new packages, I want to build all of Fedora every few days. Um, so what, what spurred this was, we have this model, and, and I think SUSE may not be exactly the same, but you're roughly similar. Um, with a spring release, uh, the Fedora project wants to rebuild everything with our new compiler. Um, and they are constantly asking us, when can we go? And we say, not yet. <laughs> um, typically, you know, they, 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 they would like to be able to start their builds with a new compiler at the start of January. Um, we never say yes to the start of January. Um, <laughs> um, we, we typically would, would green light that in late January, maybe early February. And, and it creates a lot of stress for the Fedora team, for our team, uh, for some of you who we contact, you broke Fedora builds and we can't move forward. Um, it creates problems for realm management. Um, we, we, it just, it hurts. And part of the problem here is when we find a bug and we analyze it and we hand back to the whoever wrote the code, they've moved on. They could have introduced the bug six months ago and we don't find out until December <laughs> um, of the next year. Um, so that's, that's kind of crazy. So last year, um, I said, you know, we're, we're going to do something different. And then kind of the circumstances around it was uh, Mark was busy on another project. Um, I was going to be unavailable for a period of about a month. And I said, you know, if, if, if we don't do this now, um, the Fedora project is going to have a problem. So I said, I'm just going to sit down and build it, even though I was told not to. <laughs> so I did. Um, and so it, it builds, it builds a, a new RPM of GCC and a, and a new libtil, because those two are tied together puts it in a repository, um, and then the, there's a script which says, you know, here's how you build a package. And so we modify that script ever so slightly to say, go get the compiler from over here instead of the standard place. And then everything builds with a new compiler. And there's auto, and so Fedora has almost 9,000 binary packages. So there is a little generator which generates 9,000 jobs with this itty bitty little script, um, which does these builds. Um, and so we used it uh, for, for testing GCC9 and Fedora 30. Uh, we had the builds done uh, second week of December, give or take. I don't remember exactly when. Mark didn't have to do it. Jakob didn't have to do it. <laughs> um, put all the failures in a Google Doc, which I then uh, pointed Martin Liska at, and he's like, oh, we've already analyzed most of this. <laughs> so Martin, Martin filled in a, a lot of the failures. Um, and then I was able to contact the package owners uh, and say, your package doesn't work, will not work in two months. Um, they said, oh, wow, that's, that's good to know. And oh, not only does it not work, it's got a security vulnerability a mile wide. <laughs> um, please go fix it. 
Um, and, and the response from the package, from the package owners was, was overwhelmingly good. Um, they're like, you know, we're, they were very happy to be warned with time to address the problem, so they're not getting stressed out, um, that, that the package is going to break. Um, so they're re really happy with that. Um, and I don't remember exactly when we greenlighted the Fedora bill, but it had been at least a month before we had in the past. I think I actually greenlighted it before I, I disappeared, well before I disappeared. Um, and so we tell the Fedora guys, whenever you want to go, go. That made their life a lot easier. But wait, that's not all. There's no reason you can't do this every week. What stops us from taking a snapshot and running the system every week? So that's what I did for the start of the GCC cycle. And so you could see the number of failures trickling down as, as we fixed the few compiler bugs that we had to fix. Um, and so it, it, the, the, the goal here, again, is to, for, for you guys, is when we find a bug, we get the problem out to you, you know, in a week, as opposed to six months later. So you haven't context switched off to another problem. And that allows us as a, as a whole team to spend more time in, G, in stage three fixing bugs out of the, at the bug database as opposed to another Fedora build is going to fail. But wait, there's even more. Um, who heard about Ranger yesterday? Most, a good number of you. Um, Aldi and Andrew came to me and said, hey, we've, we've heard you got this tester. Can you test our branch? Sure, no problem. So we, we set this up so that they, they had a diagnostic which said, anytime a range is different between um, VRP and Ranger, abort. So I just put that compiler into the tester and say, build every package. Anything that aborts is a bug in Ranger. And I think we, we found, was it a dozen, 15 bucks, something like that, which turned out to, well, sorry, a dozen to 15 packages that failed, and I think it was four unique bugs. And that's, <laughs> I, I don't recall the, the details anymore, but you're probably right. Um, the point being is when, when we talked about Ranger and we said, you know, we know that it's generating as good as or better ranges across the board, this is how we know that. Um, LTO testing. So I know the SUSE guys, it was kind of funny. We were, we were talking about, we should be using LTO. And, and we said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna find out how, you know, what's going to break. The next day, we got the announcement from SUSE, open is using LTO by default. <laughs> um, Regardless, we said, you know, we should, we should still do some testing. Um, and so we set, used the system to, to test LTO. Um, have we found problems? Yeah, we found the config, you know, essentially LTO breaks bad configures. It breaks them horribly. Um, and so we were able to, to extend the tester to say, build with the old compiler, build with the new compiler, or sorry, no, build with LTO turned off, build with LTO turned on, capture the config.h files you generate for every package that generates a config.h file, and diff them. If there's any difference, fail. Turns out mm, there's a whole lot of false positives because a lot of configure files have date stamps in them and flags, but it allowed us to, to see how big this problem was. Is it, is it tractable or is it not tractable? And we think it's tractable, but we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't have done this testing. Um, the more recent one we found, so when we did that testing, we found that uh, we expected more fatal warnings. So we have an injection system which injects you know, warning flags that we, we think are important. Um, and I think we got you know, a dozen warnings fatal warnings, I'm like that, there should be more. Um, as it turns out, dash wall does not get passed through LTO. Um, this is bad. Um, and so I, I've, you know, Martin and I and, and Jan have had a little bit of discussion and, and it's something we're looking to fix. But, you know, these are things we probably would have missed and I'm glad we're finding them. Um, Florian, who's not in the audience today, came to me um, about three weeks ago and said, I wanna turn off the ability to call a function that hasn't been prototyped. What's gonna break? All kinds of things. <laughs> um, it, it's about 10% of the packages that Fedora break in some way or another. Um, a lot of them are configure things, a lot of them are package things, and some of them are, are fairly serious bugs. Um, so we can, we can test, you know, if, if there's something we want to test and see what the broad scope of it is, we can do that. We want to test a warning and see how pre prevalent it is, we can do that. Um, it, it, it's proven very, very valuable already. Um, so to kind of summarize, the upstream tester, I, I really like what it's done, and I think we really want to make that public and do so as soon as possible. The Fedora tester has significant value as well. Do we want to make it public? I don't know, and the reason, it's not because I want to keep it private. It sucks up far more resources than the upstream tester. <laughs> um, it, it'll, it'll suck up as much resources as you can give it. Yep, Michael, do you have a question? And, and maybe that's the model, is, is you, we make yeah. it, the results available, 
right. and say, you know, because it's running on Red Hat internal resources, contact us and we'll, you know, it's not doing anything malicious. All right, go. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, it's testing future machines and all the things that we may not yet have the ability to put patches up upstream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of us have that, have that stuff. And, it, you know, we want to test it on our own resources. It, it, it's anyway. a common problem. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you guys work on, on architectures that aren't public. I know there are others that do. Um, th there's lots of options we could do in that space. So, and I think it's useful in that way. Ramana. The Fedora tester, is it testing multiple architectures? Or? It is not, but it's easily, easy to do. Okay. Um, one of the things we, we, we pondered is, all right, so uh, x86 resources within Red Hat are easy to come by. You know, yeah. if, I, if I want 40 machines to throw at this, sure, click, 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 click. <laughs> um, other architectures are, are a lot harder to come by. But okay. there's no, there's nothing inherently x86 specific about this. Okay. Yep, or, or there, yes, it's a shared. Slower than, than the others. So. Yeah, Jakob's comment is that, that some boxes are, are generally slower than, than the x86 hardware. Um, some of them are virtualized, so you're not getting the, the entire, you're getting a slice of a system. Okay. So it, absolutely right. Yes, it uses native hardware. In theory, you could do this on QEMU, but God, that'd be slow. <laughs> Uh, will it be possible to somehow at least share the setup of a Fedora tester that others could reproduce of their own uh, build resources? Happy to. It, it, it's, it's a page of shell script. <laughs> Happy to. There, I've, I've got nothing in, in this that, that is proprietary or, or anything I would want to keep private. There's nothing about it. I, I'm a believer in, in open source and you know, if, you, if somebody could take what I've done and do something else with it or use it internally, happy to. There's, again, nothing here that's private. With the beaker host? Um, so, so what happens, there's actually very little communication with beaker. So I have a job which allocates my new hosts with you know, a command line. And then beyond that, it's just SSH. So I, I'm not going to give you my keys. <laughs> uh, so we'll start yeah, Martin and we'll work our I way have, over. I have a few comments about the continuous uh, rebuild of distribution. Very soon what you will reach is that you have package failures because of the new warnings, whatever. And what you want to do is you, you don't want to use um, upstream of all these packages because it's unstable. Yes. So, that, so very soon you will reach package failures. And then you have packages which depend on these. And you can't be sure that the whole distribution will work if you use older build of, of the package. So that's what's blocking us in OpenSUSE because we have these kind of strong dependencies which you must fulfill. Yeah, yeah. And, if and you want to have, yeah, green, it, it, green it's, build. it's a real issue, um, and it's also the case where you know where we add new warnings and suddenly something is failing with the new compiler, um, and trying to get the packages to move forward can be slow sometimes. Um, yeah, they'll show up as failures. <laughs> yeah, and the second issue is that sometimes you have failures and you are not sure whether it's um, GCC or the the package itself. And if you create a bug, the, the reply is, okay, you're using unstable, unreleased GCC. We will take care as soon as you will release it. But you have you have a yeah, chicken egg problem that you would like to release stable GCC, but packages would like to use, yeah, yeah test absolutely. the GCC. I, I, and, and we ran into that when we were doing the Fedora 30 testing, where I, I got, there were a couple of package owners that I contacted and said, you know, if you build this with the new, with the new GCC, these are the failures you're going to get. And I'm like, um... Okay, that's nice. Uh, how can I, I, I want to fix my package, but I can't get the new compiler. And so there, there's nothing inherently preventing us from taking the repo that we, that we generate. It's just a, a DNF repo and making that public and saying, you know, if you want to test your package, here it is. You can get the compiler. It's, un, it's, it's not supported yet, but if you want to fix your package proactively, there's a way you can do it and you can test it. Um, Hans, and then we'll work our way over. Yeah, I so wonder what's the, what's the commit granularity are they all are all testers running in lockstep and they wait for the slowest target or um so it's only it, we're right now only running on one target um and so what happens is we we have the the 8000 or 9000 files uh, jobs we generate and just goes out to whatever machines available as soon as one's available it sends the job there ah, so they have different start uh, mm -hmm. commits okay thanks yep mark so, 
isn't this too much testing? So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, but but you 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 said you used it for everything. That can't be true because no, it I takes don't. I, I use hours, the so upstream testing for all my package. It takes twenty four hours. I don't do the Fedora scale testing yeah. for everything I do. So, but but even twelve hours does mean you can work on two patches a day. Yeah. So. I, I spend half my day in meetings. <laughs> uh, no, no, that, 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 that's good, but if it, uh, if there are two patches a day for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's Le legitimate question. So uh, uh, I can't remember if I, if I mentioned right now, the, the slowest part of the system is actually checking out the source trees. <laughs> the, just the amount of data we're moving around is, is kind of mind boggling. Um, and, and that actually could, could be cached. We only run one job per, per system. And so you could reuse the source tree checked out and just update it. And that's something that, that I'd like to, to add into it. It's not real hard. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing it. Um, but yes, scalability as you go beyond one person is, is yes, absolutely, Mark, it's an issue. You have those 11,000 patches a year. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to be able to test every patch. And so the, the, the upstream tester, um, the way it works is Git builds a hash for each job. And then based on that hash, it picks a time during the day to run it. So it just kind of, whenever <laughs> this target goes, it goes. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think a model where each patch is tested individually will work, just because of the scalability problems. Uh, okay, it's close, right? Yeah. I find it more difficult to um well, not to do the testing, uh, but to report the problems upstream or uh, to the community and find people, uh, well, then addressing these issues. Because usually when I report bug reports, even in Debian, uh, in January or February for a new GCC release, they are, well, not yet fixed uh, now when we have the new GCC as a default. Yep. Uh, so, for, for the Fedora tester, that, that, that is a concern. So in the GCC9 testing, most of the failures were actually diagnostics that we'd added, for, particularly around security issues. There were not a whole lot of compiler bugs. Um, and, and I think that was mostly because the SUSE guys had gone before we did. <laughs> But how, but, how, but how many bugs were there in the actual packages, in the actual source code of the packages, right, that were found by, with a new compiler and not with the older compiler? Um, I'd have to go back and look at the, at the Fedora 30 testing. It, it was a fair number. Um, right. it, it wasn't huge, I, but it I'm, wasn't insignificant. I, I mean everything except warnings, right? Warnings are... Oh, we're warning. like the package is broken? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. The, way, the way we handle that, um, so first you do a build with the new tool. If that fails, then you go back to the, the compiler that is part of that distro and build it with that. If that succeeded, then it's a, it's a bug in the new compiler. If the build with the original no, compiler no, no, fails, no, no. then we call it, we, it, we just ignore it. It quite often is not a bug in the compiler, it's a bug in the, oh, okay. in the it, it could be, but that, that will be called out as a, as a build failure right, and okay. require somebody to go look and at it. And then investigate it, right. You typically see four or five hundred. I, I saw significantly less. I think it was probably like two hundred total, give or take. Again, I think the the SUSE guys were ahead of us on this yeah, one. One hundred and fifty, I guess. And what we do is basically we report the the bugs to upstream projects. So we we have people who are maintainers, but typically you you still end up in upstream bugzilla of of the project. And it depends what they will do. So you, yeah. My my experience is that it takes time. You. Sometimes it takes time to wait for upstream, whether they come up with a reasonable patch which can fix it. It does, and we, and we have the same model where there are people that work for either Red Hat or Fedora maintainers, and then they, I, I give them the, the, you know, this thing is broken, and then they go and negotiate with upstream to get it fixed and then get the patch pulled back. But yes, that is absolutely an issue. It can take upstream a little, little time to get around to it. But you know, even if all we get out of it is you know, our bugs, we catch earlier and fix them, and we're proactively telling the package maintainers and they're proactively working with upstream, that is still a huge step up for relative to where we were.
Ramana. So one of the things that we've found in running the bots every night is just coping with the scale of test results and looking for common patterns. Have you come across that given your, your type, you're testing significantly more targets in your upstream tester? Not really in the upstream test. All we care about is regressions. So the fact that, so a, a typical like ELF target, the, the, the embedded systems, um, they typically have like 800 failures every time you run them. All I care about is, did it change? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have a mandate to, to fix all those bugs. I'm never going to have that mandate. I'm not interested in it. Yeah. Um, what I'm really looking for is regressions. And this stuff is, it, it is extremely stable. If, if it flags something as, you know, a regression, there's almost always a real bug in there. Okay. And, it, and it's, you know, one a day or one every other day, something of that, of that scale. When something does break, you know, you might see it pop up in every target, <laughs> um, I'm gonna pick up. I'm gonna pick on Jakob, <laughs> just because we, we we had one uh, earlier this week. Uh, he, there was a bug in some of the VRP or sorry, Mash.pd change, um, and every Linux kernel build failed. So it shows up. You know, every Linux kernel, tar every target that builds a Linux kernel failed, but it was all just one bug. So uh, on the previous talk, you talked about the development process of being six months of development, six months of of bug fixing, is this how you're, you want to use something like this to try to change that I want to use sense? it to help. <laughs> okay. So um, we'll have more, you know, so nine months of development or something? Or, or what do you think is. of them? Or okay. even if, and I, I don't think six on six off is the right model, but let's just say the project wants to stay six, six on six off. The, the first few months of the off cycle where we're fixing bugs, we're not looking for bugs in the targets because we know they're in pretty good shape. We know we're not looking for bugs in Fedora. It's in good shape. We, and so instead, we essentially trolling through the bug database. We could start fixing regressions earlier. Maybe we fix more of the P2 regressions. Um, those tend to grow forever. Or maybe the Bugzilla backlog just gets bigger as everyone's yep. still doing different development then. They've Absolutely. moved on. Yeah, and, and so that it has the potential for enabling us to, to do th that kind of thing, tackling the Bugzilla backlog or tackling the, the, the regression backlog, yes. For the, for the split, uh, how long stage one is and how long stage three, four is, I think, yes, CI is, is one of the things we need to do, and, and the other is how many people actually participate in the bug fixing, because not everyone does it, and some people work on features for the next stage one, of course, and, <laughs> and in that case, well, it, needs to, be, help it that needs to be that long, <laughs> because we can't shrink it, shrink it, and and she broke new code. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jakob, that, that there are some, and, and sometimes it's, it's with a good reason, sometimes, you know, for various reasons, people may choose to work on development sure, for the sure. next cycle instead uh, of bug I'm, fixing. Yeah, I'm and, not and unfortunately, anybody. it falls on your back. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, by using something like this, you know, for example, I, in the past, as soon as stage three would start, I would typically be flushing out patches from other people, and trying to give a sense of, uh, you know, for the embedded targets, is there anything I should go fix? Because I, I own a lot of embedded targets. So I don't have to do that anymore. I can actually look at something else. Next year, I won't have to look at Fedora, right? So, you know, hopefully this, this allows the developer community to actually use this time better. And, and hopefully re reduce your load, because I know it is, the number of, of bugs you have to fix in a, in a that, that six month off cycle, it's enormous. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no more questions. Oh, there's always one more. <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to disappoint you, Jeff. <laughs> so, so I, it all sounds like a great idea. What would be your estimate of how this would be phased time-wise? I would guess, so for like, for example, a, 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 an upstream patch test that people could submit to, or Somebody. even visibility of, uh, or, or visibility. of the results. That must be the easiest thing to do. Okay, right? so visibility, I can do it a day. <laughs> it, it literally is tarring up a directory and putting it somewhere where people can, can get to a web server. It, it is that simple. Um, in fact, I've already done it. So all this initially started on my laptop. So my laptop was the master. And I said, well, yeah, that works, but it uh, doesn't really help anybody else in Red Hat. 
And so the, the first step was, took the Fedora tester and moved it onto shared resources we have in Red Hat. And I did that in an afternoon. And that was mostly just data transfer time. It, it, it is simple. Um, and what I, so I do, have to do the data transfer and I have to set up some, some kind of authentication because it is running on in Red Hat internal resources. So I turn on the authentication bits. Right, so, so getting basically a, um, a bot web page that's attached to the GCC web page that yep. in some way is pretty trivial. Yeah, okay. it's really easy. And, and then I guess the next bit is having a hopper that allows you to pour something in. <laughs> I would love that to be like a git pull system, but initially, you know, drop a git formatted patch. I can, you know, if, if we put the authentication system in there where it's not running on a Red Hat internal resource and, and we open it up to people that are part of the GCC development community, that's easy. For security reasons, I would guess that the better module is, is to check it in into some repository over just mailing the patch to GCC patches because anyone can mail anything in there and then can yeah. exploit this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ideally, it would be a, 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 a access controlled repository that it would it would know to pull from, and somehow there would be like a control file which said. You know, this, here's the user, um, here's what they want tested. You know, do they care about all this embedded stuff? They may not, they may just really, I know I just changed the PowerPC backend, so just run the PowerPC backend. Or um, I want to test something on a, a branch that they have that's in a, in a public repository. That's kind of the model I'd like to run from with an access control essentially for people that, that do GCC development. Yeah, well, for, for what, what you need to actually test, you can just look at the changed files and have some analysis from that. So I have no idea what time it is. I don't know if we're short, if we're long. Excuse me? Two minutes. I'll call it good unless there's more questions. Perfect. <laughs>